Hi, I'm Jane and I'm from Occupy Bay Area United and the Occupy San Francisco and Occupy Really Anything. Um, I have been only one type of activist, which is an Occupy activist. Before that, I was not an activist. Uh, so uh, today I'm really excited to be here. Thank you guys so much um, for letting me speak because I get to talk about my favorite topic in the world, <laughs> which is financial crimes. Um, well, actually, no, it's my second favorite topic. My favorite topic is the Federal Reserve and the monetary system, but that will be for a later date. Um, so today I'll talk about financial crimes, and that's exactly why I got into Occupy in the first place, is because they started popping up everywhere, and I started reading the financial crimes, and I was like, holy crap. Once you figure out what's going on, you're like, I was flabbergasted. I was just like, whoa, they can like do this? This is, this is insane. Um, and then I said, oh, holy crap, like why aren't people revolting? Why aren't they out in the streets? And then lo and behold, as I'm asking this, it took a couple of years, but the people were out in the streets and I said, ah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to the streets with them. So um, I'm really excited about the fact that we do have something like Occupy Wall Street now, a conduit through which we can actually learn about all these crimes. Um, all right, my beautiful PowerPoint. Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I met with, uh, he's not here, but I met with this guy the other day and he said something very interesting about what Occupy Wall Street does and he said, Occupy Wall Street to me is a brand. It's a brand that stands for fighting financial corruption. I said, wow, that, that sounds really good. That's exactly what it is to me, too. I really like the fact that it's Occupy Wall Street. We're fighting financial corruption. So, um, so today I'm going to talk about financial crimes. Uh, I just took two minutes to write down a list of all the financial crimes I could just like think off the top of my head. And this was the result of like two minutes. Um, we got Goldman Sachs going to Greece, we got Lehman Brothers collapse, we got the Pledge Protection Team, which is like a special designated buyers up of the stock market to prop it up, JP Morgan Chase Whale. If you guys don't know about the whale, we'll talk, it's really fun. Municipal bond rigging, yeah, of course, all the municipalities got screwed out of um, a few basis points, which is like gazillions of dollars. We got collusion to set high TM fees. We had the WAMU collapse. The shareholders are still suing JP Morgan Chase for that. We got the countrywide fraud. I mean, there's foreclosures, like people don't have titles, like people were freaking holding up contracts to win windows and like tracing people's signatures and stuff on that. That guy is walking scot-free, Angelo Mazzillo, his cards in there. Manipulation of oil markets. Now we know for a fact that oil markets were manipulated by a group of traders who got together and said, hey, wouldn't it be fun to manipulate oil markets? Let's make them cost $100 for a barrel of oil. Never happened before. Colluded, totally did it. SEC says it's all good. They're not in jail. Silver market manipulation. They've been depressing uh, mar uh, silver prices for a really long time because JP Morgan Chase inherited a massive short position on silver with Bear Stearns. We got Goldman Sachs Abacus. That's one of the most famous um, cases where they short sold the securities they lied to investors about. TV has a good thing about that. We got TARP. That's a freaking crime in itself. Like $700 billion in like free loans because they like held a gun to our head. Um, Federal Reserve, $16 trillion bill. Yeah, that's a T. I didn't mess that up. That is a T. $16 trillion in loans. Are you freaking kidding me? That's like the entire GDP of a year. SEC refusal to prosecute anyone. Um, the LIBOR scandal. Hello, that just happened. Eric Holder's sci-fi non-prosecution. That's what I call that. You know, where Eric Holter, like our attorney general, goes out and says, oh, by the way, I'm not going to prosecute anyone because, you know, it might really mess with our economy. <laughs> Makes no sense. So there's like a ton of crimes, right? So I had to pick a couple, so I did. Um, but the thing about all of these crimes, right, they're like really brazen. Like they're out there in the open. And if you just know how to look for it, you like can't miss it. Like you start Googling this thing and you'll find all the tools that you need, right? Um, but for some reason, the like, general public really doesn't know much about these crimes at all. So how is that possible? That's because there's a really, really powerful media ideology machine at work. The mainstream media is really good at propagating these vague messages 
so that when you hear something, you're like, oh, but that's okay, right? Because they were able to propagate this story that was kind of flimsy, right? Like, J.P. Morgan Chase Whale, oh, that was fine, that was just, I, I know that they lost money, but it's all good, right? Because it was fine in it. Or like TARP, oh yeah, we gave them $700 billion, but like they paid it all back, right? You see what I mean? It's very sneaky like that. Um, so here's the mainstream messages that we get. Um, the economy will collapse unless we give banks a bailout. The economy will collapse if we prosecute fraudulent behavior. The economy will be stronger if we steal people's deposits in brokerages or banks. Uh, and financial crimes don't exist. People are really into crazy conspiracy theories. I was actually told by Robert Wright that I was a crazy conspiracy theorist. Um, <laughs> exciting. Um, uh, so basically, it amounts to that if we give banks the people's money, and then we add to it, let them do whatever they want, then we'll get a strong economy, right? That's basically what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, um, for all that the mainstream media tries to do, like, like I said, you spend like one minute Googling this stuff, you'll find the resistance culture. Um, the resistance culture is totally, totally, totally out there. Because all of these crimes have been going on for a really long time. And there's a lot of people that know about them. And there's a lot of people that have been in that world and they just morally can't take it. Seriously. They saw people get screwed, robbed, uh, our entire, you know, stolen from. The entire economic system is like undermined completely. The mainstream media is lying to us. And they just can't take it anymore and they just write about it. So seriously, if you just exert at all any effort, you'll find it. And actually, this resistance is really strong. And I'm going to talk at the end also about the fact that we need to take, uh, do we need to latch on to that. Because think about all the times we're like, oh, we can't get messaging out there. Right, because there's not like all these writers, I mean, there are all these writers write, writing about the TPP, but who has like a three time a week show for a half hour talking just about the TPP. No one, right? But like these financial crimes, they do. That would be Max Kaiser right there. So the resistance culture, these are some stars. Max Kaiser, he has the Kaiser Report on RT. I highly recommend that you all start watching that. Um, Matt Taibbi, he has a blog on Rolling Stone. Start reading that. And um, he also has really good articles about some of these financial crimes. I love him because he writes really well, and so like my favorite thing that Matt Tavis ever done was when he talked about the Abacus case, and um, he basically said that it was kind of like when Goldman Sachs took oregano and they sold it as weed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, really, really good um, stuff. And then William Black was the guy who prosecuted savings and loans crisis in the 80s. And he will go on any old show. Like, I see him on the Real News Network. I see him on Taibi. Like, he, he'll go talk to Taibi. He'll go on Kaiser. He's, like, everywhere. He'll go on Alex Jones. He'll go anywhere to be like, hey, prosecute them. Prosecute them. They're so bad. Um, so he's, like, everywhere. But, like, not everyone knows him unless you're part of that world, I guess. Question? No, comment. Taibi yeah. is... Uh, one of the major speakers at the public banking conference. So Absolutely. Sunday night, June second. Please come. And where can we read Matt Kaiser? Max Kaiser. He has a blog, maxkaiser.com, and he is shows on RT. So if you go to rt.com shows, you can watch all all of his shows have been archived. Uh, the odds she is rushing. He's today. good. He's hard hitting. Mm -hmm. All right. There's also really good blogs like Naked Capitalism, Zero Hedge. They get stuff up right away. Um, fantastic blogs. Everything you ever need to know is there. And actually, the funny part is, is that the mainstream media itself actually hounds for like these guys for these crimes. Like Bloomberg has no problem publishing all this horrible stuff that these guys do. You know why? Because it's put into the financial page, so no one's gonna read it. Right? And the people who are going to read it already know all this stuff is happening. They don't care. So, all right. With that, I want to show you my favorite video of all time because I just had to squeeze it in here. For those of you who don't know who Goldman Sachs, uh, who Goldman Sachs, no, who Max Kaiser is. How, where's the, I don't see the, I have it, but I don't see the, 
No, no, no. Can it's you? just you. What? I don't. Okay, sorry. I don't want to go Oh, okay. <laughs> So sometimes they inter, uh, interact and accidentally we get one of these freedom fighters on the main street. The Office of International Finance at HEC, the Paris International Business School. Thank you so much both of you for being on the program. Max, if I could start with you. I mean, what is it about Goldman Sachs? Well, how does it manage to turn the figures out like that? Well, Goldman Sachs are scum. That's the bottom line. Uh, they basically have co-opted the uh, U.S. government, they've co-opted the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve function, Reserve functionality, uh, they've co-opted the Obama administration, Barack Obama, uh, you know, dances to Goldman Sachs' tune, and they are really crooked and abominable in what they've done. They just remember Hank Paulson held Congress hostage, took him in the back room and said, give us $700 billion, we're going to crash this market. He's an arsonist, he's, he's an outlaw, and yet he's given you praise. Sir J. Sir J. Hank Paulson, who was CEO at, uh, at uh, Goldman Sachs? Sure, but if you go down the list, they're all Goldman Goldman Sachs scum, whether it's Hank Paulson, whether it's uh, Geithner has very close ties to Goldman Sachs, and of course all these banking uh, bonuses are paid out to all the cronies who are Goldman Sachs scum, and America for some reason has allowed this coup d'etat to take place, a silent coup d'etat, where the Goldman Sachs and their friends now control the U.S. government, and they are manipulating prices. Okay, 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 that's a pretty abrasive view of Goldman Sachs. Do you, do you know that? I will revert only to the financial world and to financial figures, and we notice that Goldman Sachs is merely uh, uh, having the fruits of its very, very important strategic choice. Let's not forget that Goldman Sachs has warned the world community about the dangers of the uh, instruments, the toxic instruments that were being used, and they were called the subprimes. And Goldman Sachs published a report a year and a half ago saying that the, gold, uh, that the subprime problem was going to cost the world world two thousand billion dollars so Goldman Sachs was the only investment bank in the United States that didn't get into this game well, of the of selling, that my uncle yeah, selling, and, selling and, and buying empty boxes mm, yes but they created many of these empty boxes they then um, bet against their own clients to whom they sold these empty boxes they coerced the federal government to get rid of their main competitors and Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns who were selling these empty boxes they co-opted foreign banks who owned these empty boxes who went to tremendous pain and suffering, and uh, they are also now caught in front running every single trade on the New York Stock Exchange with this high frequency trading scandal. They're uh, literally stealing a hundred million dollars a day. Uh, Goldman Sachs is stealing every day on the floor of the exchange. They should be in the Hague. They should be uh, taken up on financial terrorism charges, and they should all be thrown in jail. <laughs> But, uh, just, just to say okay. the okay. situation of So the guy goes, that's extreme. And he goes, well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So can you imagine that actually showed on, like, a news outlet? Like, some people watching Bloomberg that day just got to see that. <laughs> so, uh, basically, it's not... The point I'm trying to make here is that this stuff is at the surface. It's like ready to boil over. You don't have to sit there and convince someone for two hours why they need to support, you know, why like privatization is bad or like, you know, some like horrible arguments. I think if you say to anyone, Goldman Sachs is ill, they'll be like, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's right there. This is not something that we need to convince the public of. But what's important is that we actually understand what is going on here because the thing is everyone we really really need to fight for uh, against all of these crimes because they are just as bad if not worse than all the other stuff that happens that you can see a direct um, where you can see a direct effect right so we like tend to like fight for closures right because right then somebody will be thrown out but the thing is if we just allow these guys to manipulate markets that has so much more reverberations throughout the entire system. That's what causes the foreclosures mm -hmm. to even go in the first place. So it's very important to understand how these market mechanisms work, how they're manipulated by the financial sector, how the economy has gotten over-financialized, and why we need to get rid of these financiers, and these need to be our number one targets, and they need to go down. This class, the financial class, must 
be eradicated. Seriously. Okay, cool. Let's go. Let, let's talk about life. <laughs> We're going to hone in on two crimes because here's the deal. At first, when I was learning all this stuff, I was like, wow, this is so complicated. But then when I went through a couple of these crimes, like, the pattern emerges, right? So maybe if I can help you guys, um, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure there's people in here who are way better than me and know all this stuff a lot more than me, but maybe if we can go through a couple of crimes in depth, we can see, start seeing that blueprint of what happens. And also, like, maybe you won't be scared to read all the financial news articles, because we can get this. I promise. Okay, so I'm gonna go over two crimes. Number one will be overstock.com versus Goldman Sachs. Who's heard of this crime? Okay, not very many of you. That's why I picked it, I think. And number two, we're gonna go through about the MF Global Collapse. Who's heard about this crime? Okay, still, so do you see that's not a lot of people, but both of these things were absolutely and totally heinous. Okay. The way we're gonna go through the crimes is first I'll explain the mechanism. So I'll give some like abstract theory behind it. Um, like how they, like what's the mechanism of screwage of the public. Then we'll go into what actually happened during that particular instance. And then we'll talk about the media spin and what the media said, because that's very important to see the pattern. And then you'll always see it. And then you'll be like, oh. now I read all these stories and I can totally read between the lines. I'm like, oh, the story's like, oh, everything is hunky-dory. I'm like, oh man, the banks are crumbling. So, um, mm. okay, crime number one, overstock versus Goldman Sachs, the mechanism. Naked, <laughs> sale. All right, let's talk about the naked short sale and what that means. In order to talk about the naked short sale, first I have to discuss the short sale. Short sale. Short sale is a bet that a stock will go down, that a stock price will go down. So, in order, if you think a stock price will go up, all you'll do is just buy the stock, right, and hold on to it and then sell it. But what if you think the price is gonna go down? Well, here's the mechanism, this is what you do. You say, hey, I have a friend who has a stock, you borrow that stock and you say, you were gonna hold on to that for at least a month, weren't you? And they'll say, yeah. And then you'll say, I'll give you the stock back in a month. You go sell that stock and then in a month, go back to the market, buy it, and then give it back to your friend, right? So if the, mar if the price indeed did go down, when you sold it, let's say it was 10 bucks, in a month, you bought it for eight bucks and you gave it to your friend, well then you made two bucks. Right? And your friend still has that same stock. Okay? So that's a short sale. Notice that the short sale is pretty kosher, right? Because like you take a stock, you sell it, right? Then you buy it. It's all physical. There's like real stuff being sold and bought. Well, let's talk about the naked short sale. The naked short sale, imagine a short sale, except that when you sell that stock, you never borrowed it. You might be like, okay, what the hell does that mean? How can I sell a stock that I don't have, right? Like, imagine if I go out there and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna sell a Goldman Sachs piece of stock that I don't have and I just sell it. And you go, how is that possible? Totally possible. Because what happens when you do a short, uh, when you do a short sale of any sort? You go to a broker because, well, first of all, brokers are the only people that can sell and buy stocks, but the thing is, you don't have a friend that's gonna have all the stocks that you might possibly want to short. But a brokerage firm does, right? Because they have a ton of clients and so they hold a bunch of stock. So a firm kind of like Goldman Sachs, right? So you would go to Goldman Sachs and you would say, hey, Goldman, give me a stock. And you know what? Like, you just sell it. And then I'll just deliver it to you later, right? So when you tell Goldman Sachs, I want to short a stock, you're assuming that they're going in, taking one of their stocks and selling it on the market, right? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> not always. Sometimes they just sell it without ever having ever had it. Because right, they can go ahead and say, I sold the stock on the market and no one's gonna check to see if they actually had it or not. So if they sell it to let's say like even one of their own clients, then nobody will ever check, right? If they sell it to a different client, you would say, well, wouldn't that person see that they never got the stock? Sure, but stock trades aren't instant. You have three days to make good on them. And if you don't, that's called a fail to deliver. So let's say I sell a stock that I never had, and then the buyer goes, uh, three days is up, where's my stock? Oh, sorry, we failed to deliver. 
So then that's, it's almost like that trade never happened. There's lots of other reasons why, why fail to deliverers won't happen is, uh, you know, there's like a mistake in the contract or if, I don't know, traders are doing something wrong or something like that. So there's like real errors that happen. But a lot of times, uh, when a stock is sold or bought in the market, it never got sold or bought. It just got failed to deliver. So, what happens when we do a naked short sale, right? So, if I sell a stock I don't have, and I do this a ton of times, right? What's that gonna do? That's sending a lot of signals into the market about stocks being sold that's going to make the stock price goes down, right? Because people are thinking, people are dumping their stocks. So that's making the price go down. Without ever having a single piece of physical stock, if you are a giant brokerage firm like Goldman Sachs, where no one will check if you ever had that piece of stock, you have the power to send out a bunch of sell orders and make the price go down. That's market manipulation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's the naked short sale? That's a naked short sale. That's if you never had the thing you were selling. There's lots of reasons for a naked short sale. Some of them are uh, just mm -hmm. nobody, there were no stocks to borrow, so they say we'll just settle it later. Um, but yeah, that's a, yeah, you basically sold something you didn't have. Yeah? Um, it's an option. What happens to the guy who says he bought it to short it? And and it, it failed to deliver. I mean, it, okay. Right. So let's say mm -hmm. I said, I, it, you mean if I told Goldman Sachs you shorted, mm -hmm. and then what happens to me if they fail to deliver? Mm -hmm. They probably won't even tell me it failed to deliver. They'll just say you sold it, and then they'll say, oh, by the way, it's due in a month, right? And then they would say, do you want to settle this in real stock buying? You don't want me to buy a stock, do you? You don't want to go through the hassle and the fees of that. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just settle in cash? You just give me how much money it was worth today. So I, I get the extra two bucks. Yeah, you'll still get the extra two bucks. But the Goldman Sachs now sold a stock they never had and it never expects you to buy it back and give it back to them. So, so basically, who gets the, uh, somebody gets the elevator and somebody gets the shaft. <laughs> sure. yeah, that's, true. that's true in any, in any market transaction in like, you know, in, in the stock market. I mean, why is it okay, let's try to both yeah. comments, questions. So, I mean, it should be, I, I think it should be called the naked uh, fraud sale or something. Exactly. Like naked short sale is a fraudulent sale. Right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a fraudulent Even sale. Even like me, <laughs> <laughs> So, um, another way to call it is phantom shares. Right. Um, so, uh, let's talk about, so they say that naked short sales don't exist, right? Okay. So um, one of the ways, how do we know that even naked short sales happen, right? No one's going in and inspecting books and stuff. Um, so usually we know when like there's, because uh, the SEC files how many fails to delivers, fail to delivers there are. So if you ever see a spike of fail to delivers versus what happened previously, it usually means there's a bunch of naked short selling going on. Because what, did like, you know, traders become any more incompetent with that company? Probably not, right? So when there's these spikes, that's how they know. So again, it's an indirect way of knowing because none of these crimes we ever know directly. Something has to happen. MF Global has to collapse for us to know there ever was a problem, right? The banks have to ask for TARP for us to even ever know they even ever had a problem, right? All of this stuff is done in secret. The only time we know, we have to infer from all these like weird artifacts that we find and all this data. But don't worry, there's a ton of people out there interpreting this data for us. Um, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry, could we hold questions yeah, okay. till the end? So let's go through what happened with the Overstock case. So, 99, Overstock.com, launched by the CEO, Patrick Byrne. Um, it's actually, the company is in Utah. I don't know if you know what it is, Overstock. You know, they like mm -hmm. take, it's kind of like Amazon, but they took like stuff that was overstocked and then they sell it. So it's like an internet business uh, where you just buy stuff like sheets. Um, in 2002, he took it public. Uh, and then in 2005, and then the stock was growing nice and steady up until 2005, and then it crashes from $70 to $20. Um, okay. 
So why? Burns says that he was the victim of naked short selling. Overstock claimed that large portions of its stock were the subject of naked shorting. In fact, they claimed that there were times where the short position in its stock exceeded the entire supply of shares. Let me explain to you what that means. <laughs> Let's say they issued 100 shares total, right? I think it was closer to 23 million that they issued, but let's say, let's say it was 100. And then they say, huh, how many shares are shorted today? It was like 110. <laughs> how the hell could 110 shares be shorted at once? Right? That means they were able to borrow more than even there was. So this is crazy, right? It's like they were shorting more than there was. And that's just shorting, right? And then the CEO himself has shares, and he's like, well, I don't know why anyone borrow my stuff. So where is this coming from? In fact, there were intentional fail to delivers by Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch, uh, which means that they actually, in some instances, they have the stocks, but they wouldn't even borrow the stocks that they had to deliver them. They just said failed to deliver the transaction. Um, so basically, they failed, so they intentionally failed to locate and deliver borrowed shares for clients, allowing the firms to earn fees and interest on phantom securities transactions. Because each time this happens, right, they get a fee. Right? They short sold for someone so they get a fee. Or they short sell for themselves, get the price to go down, their friends come in at that time, the attack ends. Every single, uh, by the way, every single collapse of any a financial institution had a giant spike of fail to delivers. Lehman Brothers, uh, Bear Stearns, Wamu. All of these were attacked by naked short selling before their uh, demise. <clears throat> so the CEO, Burn, right, he's like, oh, there's like shares, like more shares, right? Because like his entire life, right, is when you're a public company, you're like, oh, my share price, my share price, right? When his share price is plummeting, he sees there's more stocks shorted than are in existence. He's like, SEC, investigate. And we know what happens next. The SEC investigates. But you know, we know we know the drill by now. What happens when the SEC investigates? They find some like horrible like misconduct, right? Then what happens? They say, oh, pay like two dollars, even though you made a million. And yeah, go on your merry way, do it again. So SEC investigated, it find the people, and it refused to press charges. So like in 2007 in July. Two American stock exchange options market makers were fined and suspended. Some can talk about whether you know it was a oops or on purpose, but um, from these emails, we know we got this little snippet from a Goldman Sachs executive. He sent this to someone else at Goldman Sachs saying, uh, pertaining to overstock stock. <laughs> Two months ago, 107% was floating short. What that means is that 107% of overstock total stock was shorted. The Goldman Sachs executive in his email admitted to another Goldman Sachs person, hey, we're float, like, is this not cool? Anyway, so there was also a lot of other damning emails that had stuff about fail to delivers where they would say, uh, another brokerage would ask Goldman Sachs, hey, do you guys punish fail to delivers? And Goldman Sachs goes, no, go ahead, fail to deliver. We don't care. Meaning, go ahead, naked short sell fraudulently. <clears throat> okay. So then Taibi um, is writing a story in expose. He's like, oh my god, this is like my, my, my Christmas. And so he's writing this expose and he contacts Goldman Sachs. And this is what they respond to him. Overstock pursued the lawsuit as part of its long-standing self-described jihad designed <laughs> to distract attention from its own failure to meet its projected growth and profitability goals and the resulting sharp drop in its stock price during the 2005 to 2006 period. Wow. So like, this is what the Goldman Sachs PR person sent Matt Taibbi, which Matt Taibbi, of course, published. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they said that they're like on a jihad against us. They must be terrorists. <laughs> oh, I love this language, it's so fun. Okay, so, uh, 
Okay, so now we're, so that, that's where we are today basically, is we're still in the whole making it public thing, there was just the oops. So that was the fight. Not much of a fight, that's probably why not everybody has heard of it. But let's talk about the media spin that came out of it. Byrne is blaming naked short selling for failures as a CEO. You'll see this all the time. We can never prove without a shadow of a doubt that they sh make a short sold, except for when stuff is floating short over 100%. Mm -hmm. Then we can, and I don't think that, you know, that's necessarily his failure as a CEO. Naked short selling is a conspiracy theory. Seriously, like, Google naked short selling, you'll see conspiracy theory, like, really high up there. So it doesn't exist. And naked short selling used to be done, but not anymore. <laughs> Because you see, in 2008, they like outlawed it or something. They did it. What they did is they said, oh, don't do it anymore. But there's no punishment or anything. You can do whatever you want. You just can't do it. You, it's, um, they will fine you if they can prove that you did it in order to manipulate market. Mm. <laughs> wow. But we can never prove that they were manipulating markets, let alone. But that's exactly what they're doing. Um, the lessons that we learned from this, look, over-financialization kills the real economy. There is nothing underlying wrong with Overstock.com stock or any other company that's being naked short sold. There are no real economic fundamentals that have anything to do with the stuff that's going on in the marketplace right now. Okay? This is killing the productive forces of the economy. This guy made like a website. He was like a perfect capitalist, right? I mean, here we might say, ooh, boo, capitalism, right? But, but at some point, right, like most of America is like not there yet and they're, you know, they want to just be a good capitalist and make their, you know, they make their company, it went public, they got the capitalist dream and then bam, make a short selling. What the hell? I ran my business well. I was a good capitalist. Um, so it kills the real economy. How are we expected to even, if new liberal ideas even got us to the right place, which I don't think they do, but even if they did, how can we get there? We can't, right? Um, another thing that's really important to take of this is financiers can kill any public company. That's it. They kill every public company. They, they have that power. It's called naked short selling. All they have to do is just collude, make a run on it, and bam. So if you, there is no competition out there. They have the power. So if you were ever thinking like, oh, is it, you know, GE that's like super evil? Like, yes and no. Like if they ever actually start stepping on the toes of the financiers, they'll kill them. So the Koch brothers though, can't. They're, they're, they're a private company. <laughs> can't kill them by naked oh. short selling. Oh. Um, and then another thing is that stop naked short sales. I want to, like everybody I've talked to always says, restore Glass-Steagall should be our like one big headline. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's the one big headline. It's just the one that people know the most because it makes sense. Like you can't put customer money with betting money, right? But what about like stop naked short sales? That's just as valid because they're killing the economy. You can't. <coughs> You can't just kill companies like this. <laughs> right? Make a short sale. Okay, direct action people, take it away. I know you're going to think of something really good. Um, well, I would get naked nurses this time in front of a JP Morgan Chase building. Um, okay. So that was overstock. We're ready to go on to MF Global. Question. Do you want to wait for questions from the very end? Yeah. Unless it like, well, is it a clarifying question? Well, it, uh, it, I this is the first time that I've come close to understanding short sales. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> but what I realized about halfway through is that it's almost exactly what they did with the uh, the mortgage collateralization right. stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's very helpful. <laughs> okay. Selling stuff you don't have happens often. Okay, so we're going on to the MF Global Collapse. The mechanism. Rehypothecation. All right, guys. We're going to get this. <laughs> Let me explain to you what hypothecation is. <clears throat> hypothecation 
location is when a bank owns collateral. Okay, no. Okay, let's say you bar you may have a loan from a bank that is collateralized, meaning that some some asset is underneath that loan. So I screw that. Let's go through a house. I have a mortgage with a bank, right? I own the house, correct? Mm -hmm. But if I default on that loan, what happens to my house? The bank will take it, right? The bank hypothetically owns the house. That's what that means. That if that they have a loan with me, if I default, they'll take it. So hypothecation is like a mortgage. It's when your collateral is hypothetically owned by the bank. Okay, sure, that's just a definition, whatever. Rehypothecation, genius. So now the bank says, hey, I hypothetically own her house. I'm gonna put this as a collateral for my, my loan. That's rehypothecation. So they, they don't own anything, right? Technically, the way that you have to think about it, the reason it kind of sort of makes sense in their world is because they say, well, either she's getting the house or the income coming from the loan, right? But it's the house that is then rehypothecated. So the deal is in the United States, you're allowed as a company to do this 140% of the original collateral, okay? In the UK, however, so, so meaning like if, if I, if, if Ryan has a loan with me for his house that's $100,000, then I can get a $140,000 loan for it, based on his house, putting that as collateral. A second mortgage. Right, but he doesn't know about it, okay? <laughs> so that's 140%, that's called Regulation T, or Reg T for short. Well, um, in the UK though, in the city of London, it's a gazillion percent? It's nothing, it, there's no limit. You can just like, I can put Ryan's house in like 10 different loans and say I collateralized it and like that's it. So that's why, guys listen to me, this is why every single one of these sordid scandals always goes through the city of London. There's always a UK subsidiary, okay? There's always a UK subsidiary. Where was the London, uh, where was the JP Morgan Chase whale? London. There's always a UK subsidiary that's rehypothecating things to like the max. Okay, so uh, in 2007, rehypothecation accounted for half the activity in the shadow banking system, by the way. Um, also, before the Lehman collapse, Lehman was rehypothecating. Uh, they calculated that US banks were receiving, the IMF calculated that US banks were receiving $4 trillion worth of funding by rehypothecation. Okay, these are like huge numbers that mean nothing to me at some point. Okay, another mechanism is leverage. Okay. So, for me and you, in order to buy a stock that costs $10, how much do we have to pay? $10. $10, but not for the banksters. They can buy it on margin. They can buy the stock for like $2. But, here's the catch, right? So let's say we have a $10 stock, right? And let's say you put up only $2 for it. Um, well, somebody is your like lender, right? Let's say it's Goldman Sachs, and I am the one that put up $2. Well, let's say that then the stock, uh, but the thing is Goldman Sachs gets nervous, right? Because if this stock drops in value, I only pay $2 for it. But it's like $10, right? So if it drops in value, they'll get like nervous that I will like default on my loan because I technically owe them eight bucks here, right? So they say, hey, if this stock drops by a dollar, you will have to pay us back fully with the stock. So now let's say that the stock drops to $9. Mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs will say, never mind, never mind, give us the stock back. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> okay. So if the stock drops to $7, right, I only paid two for it. So in order for me to buy it, I would have to pay another eight. And it's, uh, and it's only like, um, so I'm like likely to default to Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs gets nervous. So even when it drops down just a little bit, I mean, this is the same thing as underwater mortgages. 
right? You know how people don't want to pay an underwater mortgage because they're like, well, it's worth more than it mm -hmm. is. So they know about this kind of stuff. So it's the same way that you'll have an underwater stock, mm -hmm. right? So they'll say like, even if a drop, even though I pay two dollars, so really this can go down to eight dollars and still be okay. Goldman Sachs will start calling in my debt once it goes down to nine dollars or so. So that's called calling margin. Goldman Sachs will start calling the margin. So that's called leverage. Is when you put up only a little bit par partially of what you actually are buying. So when you buy a two dollar, when I put up two dollars for a ten dollar stock, I'm leveraged one to five because I'm leveraged two dollars for ten dollars, which is one to five. So I have five to one leverage. And why would you do that? Because then I don't have to put up all the money to buy the stock. I can buy like if with like twenty bucks, I can buy ten units of stock instead of two units of stock. And you're hoping it will go up. Oh yeah. I'm hoping I can manipulate the market for it. And then if it starts going down, you can cancel the deal. Well, no, you cancel the deal, but now you have to come up with all the money. So what happened in MF Global? MF Global served two functions. MF Global was a company that was a derivatives broker and an investment firm. Okay, um, let me explain what a derivatives broker does. The thing is, you might have heard of derivatives as being these evil things, right? They're only evil when they're speculated upon. Okay, derivatives within themselves are, oh God, people are gonna really hate me for saying this, but <laughs> if I was in a libertarian place, people would love me. It's like guns, right? <laughs> Meaning that somebody has to wield them. In, I mean, it's like a thing, right? Like it's like a mathematical formula versus like a thing. Like somebody has to wield it inappropriately, severely inappropriately for it to have really horrible effects, right? So, but why do derivatives come into being? They actually serve really important economic functions. Here are some examples. Like, let's say I'm a farmer and I make wheat. And I'm worried that by the time I finish the wheat, making the wheat, the prices will go down. But I invested in making my wheat based on the prices today. What do I do? I will go and I will say, hey, I'll make a contract with like an investment firm that will say, I will deliver you the wheat tomorrow for the prices that are today. That gives the farmer price stability, right? He knows how much he's gonna make for sure, okay? So that stability helps the economy go. So it helps the farmer make the farmer stuff. Another example of this is gasoline for airlines. They have to figure out how many flights they're gonna make today for like June, right? But what if like oil prices go up? Well, they'll buy derivatives to like protect them from that, meaning that they'll say, we're buying gasoline at today's prices in June, just so that they can plan for it. Like an insurance. It's not an insurance. It's actually just the delivery of the good later for prices today. That like the same as futures? That is a future. Oh. It is a future. That what I just described is a future. Okay. So, if you're a farmer or an airline, you need to make these contracts, right? So you go to brokerages. So that's what MF Global was. It held a bunch of client funds for farmers and brokerages and for like airlines and stuff. Mm -hmm. Commodities. Okay, now it was also an investment firm where they were like, hell yeah, let's go bet a bunch on Greek sovereign debt. <clears throat> so also, like, right, so they were this brokerage firm where they like were the market maker, but then also they were like this kind of hedge fundy thing where they just like, because now they have money sitting in these brokerage funds. Gotta play with it, right? So they were also an investment bank, which just means gamble. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about John Corzine. John Corzine, 94 to 99. Doesn't it always start there? <laughs> CEO Goldman Sachs. This is so the poster boy for the revolving door. 2009, 2006, US Senator in New Jersey, Democrat. 2006 to 2007, Governor of New Jersey, 2009, ooh, defeated for re-election. <laughs> so, you're the chairman and CEO of MF Global. That's how, this is, oh, love this, oh, so good. Okay, so, um, you know, he's had some Goldman Sachs history, and Goldman Sachs is giant, they have like badass investments. You know, and he's like, I'm gonna make MF Global the next Goldman Sachs. And he like went on this crazy Greek debt bonanza in the repo market and he like bought up all this stuff on crazy leverage. I mean, he flooded all the money to the UK subsidiary where you could rehypothecate to like infinity. Then he like, basically in the end, his position is this like giant 
gamble on that greed, the, that the Eurozone won't let Greece default. So like the Greece, <laughs> right? So then it will all be good. Um, and so he bet this giant position, was leveraged 40 to one, that means for $400 worth of stuff, it was more like for $6.3 billion worth of stuff, he only paid 140th of that. And then what happened is, uh, and then basically Greek debt is downgraded, the, the, the Greeks is almost in default, and they have to take haircuts. Okay, so remember, they never like defaulted, they had to take, bondholders had to take haircuts, which now make the securities worth less. This is where leverage comes in. If he actually had the actual securities, it'd be fine. They would have just had like some loss, but they were leveraged. So now, the other banks get nervous, they're calling in the leverage debt. This is why leverage is so bad. They are calling in the leverage debts. He's having money hemorrhage out of like the company. And then like, we don't know what happened, right? Well, we know what happened. All those poor people with their deposits, the farmers from Minnesota buying wheat futures, wiped out, right? So in October 2011, M31, uh, M of Global files for bankruptcy. It's the eighth largest bankruptcy in the United States. And, um, Roughly, and then uh, all the, like right away, the client accounts are frozen, right? Because then the clients are like, I want my money, and they're like frozen. So then they, they get frozen. About 38,000 accounts were um, affected. Wow. Um, at the time, the trustee estimated that it was $600 million from customer funds was missing. Later revised to $1.2 billion. Later revised to $1.6 billion. And that's where it stayed. So another pattern, guys, by the way, it always gets bigger. The first report is never how much money was lost or missing or they need from us, okay? It always, oh, but then there's this too. So yeah, $1.6 billion of people's money gone, missing. So the thing is that it was basically through this whole like complicated money moving scheme, which isn't complicated at all, basically people were asking, where's my money, make my margin calls, and they just, gave the money. It was just clients' money. Um, yeah. Um, I know that the Glass Steagall Act was canceled, but was there anything canceled with um, the no. purchase? Were they ever not allowed no. to do this? So yes and no. They have strict rules upheld by their governing body, which is the CFTC, the Commuter Commodities and Futures Trading Commission. And it's supposed to like make sure that client funds are segregated. <laughs> And so was there ever a law that? What? Was there ever a law Yes. It's, it's a regulation. regulation. It's not a law. A regulation. So they just did mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a law. They, did, right. they just disregarded regulation. Right. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. so did they change also the way they filed for bankruptcy. Didn't they Please. change the commodities future uh, law? No. I thought they did Clinton back in Clinton's day. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. So I am not, I, I don't know. Okay, so then in November 3rd, so the thing collapses October 31st. November 3rd, Corzine resigns. And then in December, he appears before um, the Senate committee because everyone's like, where's my money, right? And it's like these farmers in the Midwest who can't like have all their stuff, who have all their accounts frozen, right? Like how are you supposed to like have an economy, right? How are you supposed to be like a farmer or like, you know, you have like all your money is frozen, that means business stops. Do you see how these guys like basically latch on to real business and make it stop for their own gain? Um, so I want to play this for you. So he appeared before the Senate. I simply do not know where the money is. <laughs> I don't recall. I don't. I. I. I, I don't know. I don't know. Don't recall. One point two billion dollars of customers' money. You know nothing about it. I take full responsibility. I just, you know, the one thing that struck me was George Ryan about your governor or senator. I don't know what to call you exactly. <laughs> <laughs> John, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Can you, sir, tell us today that while you've been uh, 
the head of this organization, MF Global, that you always did the right thing when no one was looking. All <laughs> <laughs> of my grandmother's advice. Every effort and intent in my actions were to do the right thing. Uh, and the more aggressive uh, the enterprise, uh, the better those kind of rewards would be. Now certainly, most of the investors are very sophisticated people, correct? They understand uh, the nature of, of the kind of enterprise that you've been a part of. Some of the investors are very sophisticated investors. Uh, uh, Oklahoma call it a high-powered gun. <laughs> I never intended to authorize anyone. So you never intended to, but you may have. <laughs> I, I, I did, it was a misunderstanding. Yeah. So the answer is, is you don't know whether you did or not. I'm going to repeat what I said before. I have no recollection whatsoever. I did not intend to raise that. The real answer is I, I don't know. I, 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 I really don't, Congressman. <laughs> All right, so that was a little mashup made by Reuters. Again, so do you see even the mainstream media is like, oh, guys. Um, so in December 2011, physical assets were unfrozen. I want to just discuss that for one second because the thing is, they were that brokerage firm with like the futures delivery, remember? The thing is, some people would buy futures and actually expect delivery of the good, right? So they would buy today's prices, somebody who really wanted that price stability and is expecting like the wheat. Mm. Or most of the times it's not the wheat, it's the gold, right? So they were expecting this gold and this gold was delivered to them. The future contract was up, let's say in November. It would be settled with MF Global, their brokerage, and it would sit in the MF Global's vault and then people would have a receipt, right? So I bought a future, the gold was delivered, I now have a receipt that says I have gold laying there in MF Global. That was all gone. I will have gold. They took all that. They now said that you don't have any physical assets. Physical assets were frozen too. Only in December were they unfrozen and they didn't get all the gold. They got back 78% of whatever it was worth. 72%. So gold and silver were stolen in that heist. That's always there as well. Have you guys noticed Cypress gold stuff now? That's always a part of it too, gold and silver confiscation. <clears throat> yeah. What happens to that other 28%? Right, it was just gone, right? They, they lost the money, yeah, the camel delay. But the thing is what happened to the physical stuff? Probably, you know, it's still one. Yeah. So, um, fast forward to today, April, April 2013. Finally, the trustee is done with all this stuff. The report is published. Um, the bankruptcy is ended. Um, the terms reached. We're all good. The bankruptcy is ended now. Here are the terms. The effect of the settlement is essentially to enhance JP Morgan's potential recovery <clears throat> to 76 cents for every dollar of claims. Uh, but uh, the unsecured creditors will see uh, only 34 cents on the dollar. <laughs> but basically, the people got some of their money back. It's not it's not the money they filed for bankruptcy. Okay. I'm going to skip them the J.P. Morgan Chase connection, but there is one. J.P. Morgan Chase, by the way, was the custodian of client funds, their clearinghouse, and their primary lender, and they took out all the money right before it collapsed. So always the important institutional investors never lose. Remember that as well. Media spin. Everything's so confusing. Client money? What client money? No idea. So confusing. <laughs> J.P. Morgan Chase money. Well, that's creditor money. We paid that back. But did we mention how confusing everything is? <laughs> they actually hired a PR firm to make the, the confusing argument for them and frame it. Yeah. Hmm. It's like the black belt glove. So what we learned is that over-leveraged bad bets are being made. Now, you must understand, this is happening everywhere right now. We just got to see the MO Global stuff because they collapsed so we could actually, you know, reporters had access to their stuff. It's happening everywhere. These leveraged bets with daisy chains, they're everywhere. They're gonna collapse. JP, I mean, you saw the Cypress Banks collapse. JP Morgan Chase is gonna collapse. If you have your money in JP Morgan Chase, it's gonna be taken. You will you take have your money in any bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, now as a conclusion of my presentation, I want to just talk about why I talked about these crimes. There were some more exciting crimes. These were my favorite crimes. But why did I pick these crimes to talk about? They happened during Occupy. The judge, the court case with Overstock.com happened in San Francisco in January of last year. I tried to get people to go, but, but whatever, nobody even knew about Overstock. It's out, um, also these, so we can actually action these things when they happen, okay, if we just keep vigilant. It's also a great outreach to the middle class. I am totally for foreclosure defense. I'm all for that. But I also think that we need to outreach to the middle class. And to the middle class messages such as with overstock.com, like you want to start a business, you just want to have like a business and like be a normal responsible person, well guess what, they're going to take you down. People are going to really join us. MF Global, like farmers, like random people, like what, like you can't even do brokerages, like people were so pissed. Like these are normal people, regular people from the middle class, okay? And it's great messaging opportunities. Remember how I talked about all those people that are ready to talk about all this stuff was front line and center on all those shows. Kaiser, Taibi, right, everything. We don't have to try to like get the messaging out. We just talk to them, right? The thing is, all those, oh, I'm gonna get to this, okay, which is this thing. So Kaiser, if anybody knows about Kaiser, he always talks about Giabo, the global insurrection against banker occupation. Um, that's like his thing. He's like, why are people getting up, right? And then he was like, well, maybe Giabo is Occupy Wall Street. And so I have Occupy there because I say that this is the think, right? That's Kaiser. All he does is talk and tell you, all they do is talk. They talk a lot and they talk well and they'll cover everything, but they talk. What we do here at Occupy is we do. We take that stuff and we make it be actionable. We say, we as people are so pissed at what's happening. We're going to be out in droves, right? And we always have problems for finding who's going to talk about what we do. We already have people who are talking about that stuff. And so the thing is that um, the thing is that the banksters are loving what's happening right now. We have the thinkers and then we have the doers, right? Right? We got people who are like sitting there shouting from the rooftop, somebody please, like there's crimes going on. I'm a whistleblower, there's crimes, right? And then we're over here, right? And we're like, we gotta do something, we gotta do something, right? Like this just to me, personally, like when I see this inefficiency, right? I'm like, ah. Oh. So I really hope, like this is why I talked about those particular crimes, because we could have done something there and gotten on all those shows. They have like a gazillion followers. They have like a whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And we are perpetuating, we're reinforcing the brand of Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. right? So to me, like even if you think that this is really hard to understand or whatever, like so is CCSF privatization. Like WASC, ACC, JC, dude, like when I first saw that, I was like, oh my God. And then I like read about it and I got it, right? And we're, we're explaining it, right? This stuff, we don't even have to explain it as much. We just have to get it ourselves, and then I think people will get on board. So I guess my point out of all of this, you can disagree with me if you want, um, but my point is that we really, like these things are really important to combat. Because people, like whether you are a leftist, right person, Marxist, whatever, you're being screwed by the financialization. The financiers are screwing capitalists. <laughs> like, it's okay. Capitalists will stand with us in this fight. Right? And then that's how you radicalize a population. Right? I came in because of this stuff. Now I know about GMOs and Monsanto and like, oh my god, war and drones and like knew none of this crap before, right? So if I was radicalized, right? So can other people. And so I guess that's my thing, is that like we need to start activizing out instead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So I'm gonna ask you.
you. So what do people do about it? Because I think, it, you said this is stuff that's going on all the time and they're doing what they want. What is it that people are supposed to do about this? So uh, I have a personal answer to that. So a lot of people answer differently. My personal answer to that is um, everything that we have to demand has to change the power structure. Okay, so it has to take away some uh, something that they use to uh, enslave us, right? It has to take away a tool. So number one, first and foremost, I advocate public banking because that takes away the private federal printing money by the Federal Reserve. Okay, then you can start saying things like end high frequency trading, end short, uh, end naked short sales, and all basically manipulation of markets. All we have to say is we are onto you. They'll get real scared real fast, you see, because right now they have a bunch of people screaming from the rooftops nobody knows. But think about if the actual populist action just said, end high frequency trading, they'd be like, holy shit, right? They'd get really scared, right? Because the whole way that they, the reason they can do all this stuff is because they think no one knows. So that's, I mean, so at first it's just like uh, educational almost, but it's also to like, the things you demand are to have them stop, do the things they're doing to screw us, right? Why overstop? Was there some particular reason or did they pick companies at random? I mean, there's a pattern, obviously, you were pointing out that the, right. uh, you know, these. So that the company was, um, was, because they did their IPO, Goldman Sachs did, I think, so they, uh, they controlled enough of the shares to be able to like do it undetected, I think. Mm. But they do it to lots of little companies. There is like thousands of little companies that they do that to all the time. In fact, there's this one guy, right? So they kept saying naked short selling doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so this one guy decided to prove that it does. So he bought all the shares of the company. Mm. Like every single share. And it was a company that he thought they would attack. So he goes out and buys like all the shares. And then, lo and behold, shares are being shorted. <coughs> but he has all of them. So then he buys those. And he says, I ended up owning like 1.2 million shares of a total of 1.1. Mm. So uh, they just pick little companies that they can really like fall, fall, fall. Mm. The thing is like once you start, the way that naked short selling works is that once they start making the price fall, it triggers, if they can make it fall mm. far enough, it triggers stop losses. Stop losses are those things on your like uh, mutual funds mm -hmm. so that they don't lose too much. As soon as that's triggered, they'll sell, which yes. depresses the thing even further. So if they can just trigger a stop loss or two and then get even more, they'll get it really down. They'll buy it up at like really low prices and be good to go. Mm -hmm. 